Hello and welcome. This is the Focus Masterclass podcast, where we speak to some of the great minds in visual effects to dive deep into every part of the industry, from production, the creative process, business, and technology. In this edition, MPC VFX supervisor Eric Nash walks us through the visual effects work for Call of the Wild. Here he talks about the stunning virtual distant locations they made featuring the Alaskan Yukon. Enjoy this first part of Eric Nash's Masterclass. Hello, my name is Eric Nash. I'm a visual effects supervisor currently employed by MPC. I've been at MPC uh, coming up on eight years in a couple of months. Prior to that, I worked at Digital Domain for two stints, uh, totaling about 17 years. I've been in the visual effects business for over 30 years. And in this podcast, I'm going to talk about Call of the Wild and the virtual location work we did at MPC for Call of the Wild. MPC did 100% of the visual effects on Call of the Wild, which is a little rare, usually a big show like that. And Call of the Wild was certainly a big show is often divided up among multiple vendors, but MPC, mostly in Montreal, but uh, with a lot of asset work being done in London, as well as a lot of compositing and match moving and roto and paint done in India. Uh, For those of you who aren't familiar with Call of the Wild, which hopefully isn't many of you, being the the classic piece of literature that it is. Uh, It's Jack London novel set in the 1890s. And it's a story of a a dog who at the outset is a very pampered domestic pet living in uh, Northern California. And because of the Yukon gold rush, the demand for dogs in the far North was very high and There were a lot of instances where domestic dogs are uh, kidnapped or dog napped, I guess, and taken to the Yukon and put to work on dog sled teams. So that's what happens to Buck. And the bulk of the movie takes place in the Alaskan and Canadian Yukon far north. The story has been made into films numerous times. What was going to be different this time was Buck, the lead dog, as well as all the other dogs and all the other animals that appear in the movie were going to be done digitally. That was part of the idea for making this movie. The reason for that was to give the filmmakers total control over the dog's performance. Any, anyone who's ever spent any time with live dogs on set knows, uh, even the best trained dogs are hard to direct. So given the desire of the filmmakers to really get a performance out of Buck, they decided right up front that it was going to be all CG animals. Given that fact uh, meant uh, it was going to be a huge visual effects show, which then opened the door to not shooting the movie in the environment that it was set in. If you've read anything about uh, what the production went through on The Revenant to, to shoot a movie like that actually in the wilderness, it's incredible incredibly difficult and uncomfortable working conditions. So knowing that so much of the movie was going to be, was going to have visual effects involved, the idea was, well, let's not go to the trouble of traveling the production team to the Yukon. Let's shoot the movie somewhere more hospitable. Uh, In our case, the desire was to shoot in Southern California. And we applied for and received the California tax credit, which made it possible for us to do that. So whereas the movie is set both in Santa Clara at the very beginning of the movie, which is Northern California, but like I said, a good 90% of the movie takes place in the far North. Everything we shot was shot in Southern California with the sole exception of a, a river rapid scene, which was shot by an action unit in British Columbia without without principal cast 
uh, and without the main crew. So we had uh, we had the opportunity and the reason to create the surrounding Yukon environment digitally, which is the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about today. Part of what made that uh, an interesting challenge was our shooting schedule sort of bridged the late summer, early fall 2018, yet a good part of the story takes place in the winter. So there were times when we were shooting in 90 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures and all of the actors and extras were wardrobed as if it was the dead of winter which made it really hard on those performers. We had to go to great lengths to keep them hydrated and keep them cool. So given that the movie is set in the late 19th century uh, and that we weren't shooting where it was set, all of the exterior locations were uh, had to be built, and they were being built at a ranch in Santa Clarita, California. And so early in prep, our production designer started designing these sets. And then we had the conversations about how much would be built and how much would be set extensions. For financial reasons, we kept the builds to as contained a footprint as possible. And there were quite a few different location or sets that that had to be built because Buck's story takes him through uh, three different owners. We had to show him arriving in Alaska. So there was at this ranch, uh, this movie ranch, we built, oh, I guess it was four, four primary sets. The first one being Skagway, which is the the sort of point of arrival for most of the people heading to the Yukon for the gold rush. And it was probably our biggest set in terms of footprint. But again, we only built what we absolutely had to and everything around it was done as a vast set extension. The The second uh, set that we encountered was a, a place called Sheep Camp. And this is where Buck meets the... The rest of the dog team he's going to be a part of. <clears throat> and it was basically a, a tent city, again, built at our ranch, probably occupied a footprint, uh, oh, I don't know, 200 feet by 300 feet. Um, and that particular set needed to be snow covered. And that was one of the instances where we did tons of fake snow. And we used every kind of fake snow imaginable, uh, whether it was real ice out of a snowmaking machine or plastic snow which has its own complications and that you have to you have to remove it you can't just let it blow away uh and paper snow as well anytime we had to do had to have falling snow that was done digitally but snow on the ground and snow on the sets was was done practically dawson city was probably the set we spent the most time in and this is the the sort of gateway to the yukon gold fields really a sort of very rough and tumble western town uh for that one we built Basically, one city block, both sides of the street, was probably 100 meters long. But we often saw out each end of that street. And this block was at one end of the town. So when you looked out to the west, as it was oriented on on set, you saw out into the, the wilderness. And looking in the other direction, you were looking into town. And the rest of that town that you saw in that direction was all... Uh, CG set extension, which whenever we looked that way also had to be populated with crowds that were also done digitally. Um, The final major set was the one where the Harrison Ford character and Buck wind up for the pretty much the last third of the movie. It's basically, uh, it was what we were called, we called the ramshackle cabin and it was basically a dilapidated log cabin that they discovered uh, way out in the wilderness. That one, the cabin wasn't that big, but there was a fair amount of landscape around it that was dressed with 
grasses and rocks. We also built a stream that ran in front of it. And that was a real stream with uh, recycling water uh, at a couple points in the story. The John Thornton character, played by Harrison Ford, goes in the stream, as well as Buck going in the stream. That was a rather large uh, physical effects undertaking. But in terms of creating the surroundings around these sets that we built, we obviously had to have tons of material to allow us to, in a photographically realistic way, recreate that Yukon surrounding. So early on in, in prep, in conjunction with the director and the production designer, we, and also with the aid of a location scout who is based up in that part of the world, we started looking at specific locations in the Yukon that we wanted to reference for our uh, CG environments. So we used Google Earth for a lot of that. Um, a lot of it was from materials that the location scout had, and we eventually honed, uh, whittled it down to, oh, probably a dozen or so different places up in that part of the world where we were would ultimately send our photogrammetry team. It was a, a team out of Montreal. I think some of them also came from Vancouver. I think it was, I didn't go, so I'm working off memory here, but I think it was somewhere in the vicinity to eight to 10 people, including some local hires to assist. And we sent them up north twice, once in the summer, and once in the winter. And they, in each case, spent weeks up there. Um, some of the places they visited uh, were only accessible by helicopter. And they would, you know, venture out. You know, and some of the helicopter flights were fairly lengthy. And they'd set the helicopter down in some meadow. And the team would spend the day documenting and capturing literally terabytes of high-resolution photographs uh, they did a lot of round shot photography. I also tasked them with shooting high dynamic range sky domes that we would use later on, both as skies for compositing into shots, but also as a source for some onset lighting that we had developed new technology for. So they, uh, like I said, two different sessions up there, just really capturing a vast amount of uh, material for our asset teams to use to rebuild and recreate the many different locations uh, that we would see throughout the movie. While they were doing that, it was not just about the environments writ large, but also uh, a lot of detail photography of the different kinds of plants and trees and rocks and dirt and you name it because all of that material had to be recreated digitally i should point out that you know talking about the sets the movie is basically it's basically a movie made two different ways there's the portion of the movie where buck is with humans and that portion was done you know, in a traditional visual effects way. We shot plates, we had a stand-in for Buck, and, you know, we shot on these sets we built. Whenever Buck left the side of the humans and was out in the wilderness, either alone or with the pack of wolves that he winds up with or confronting the grizzly bear that he does at several points in the movie. Those parts of the movie where Buck is not with the humans are 100% digital. There was no plate photography. Um, it, was, it was pretty much produced the way Lion King was produced. And that uh, wound up being a good third to almost 40% of the movie was produced that way. And that's where all this material that our photogrammetry team captured in the Yukon came into play. The story takes place over the course of more than a year. So we had to show all four seasons uh, in this far north world. And that was one of the 
places where these sky dome high dynamic range sky dome images came in handy uh we we wound up with a library of over 500 different sky domes that pretty much covered every imaginable type of sky you could think of in terms of amount of cloud cover type of cloud cover time of day and we leveraged that library to have a lot of choices scene by scene in terms of, okay, what is the, the weather? You know, what time of day is it? What season is it? And we would pick a sky dome ahead of time for each scene. So we knew how to light the set, which, you know, for these big ex- exterior sets was quite an undertaking. Given that we we're shooting in Southern California, you know, we could pretty much count on direct hard sun and, Given the time of year we were shooting, the sun was usually quite high in the sky. So for all of these sets, we went to great lengths to be able to silk over them uh, to create a diffuse daylight. Because for the majority of these scenes, we didn't want hard sunlight. We wanted some sort of overcast or you know, late in the day, low sun, which we would create artificially under the huge silks that we would stretch over these sets. In addition to the four major sets, there were, oh, probably seven minor sets, including uh, some underwater tank work where um, at one point, the, one of the people who is with Buck and the dog team, uh, they're crossing a frozen river and the character named Francoise, played by Cara G, falls into the, breaks through the ice and winds up under under the ice and Buck dives in to, to save her. The underwater portion was shot in a tank at our ranch. Uh, and given that the tank is essentially a big swimming pool, everything we see under the ice other than the actress or her stunt double had to be created. So we had to create an underwater uh, river setting, a lot of particulate in the water. The scene, the sequence really turned out great. And it was one of the, the more challenging ones just because of the, the stunts involved and animating buck underwater and wet fur. It was uh, quite an undertaking. One of the other uh, things we had to do, uh, some of the campsite sets where the dog team would stop at the end of the day and spend the night were shot on the soundstage. And one of the things we undertook at the outset was to to avoid the, the curse of trying to create day exterior sunlight or skylight uh, on a soundstage. It's one of the, the toughest lighting tricks to pull off. So we, we decided up front that we were going to leverage these high dynamic range sky domes that we had uh, such a great library of and use LED practical lighting fixtures that are controllable both in intensity and color and build a grid of those that f- completely filled the sound stage and with a silk underneath those LED lighting units of which there were close to 300 of them we drove that lighting via the a high dynamic range sky dome image, a lot of painstaking color space, color science work had to be done. Um, But the beauty of it was you got this very naturalistic, uh, very realistic skylight on a soundstage. In addition to having a background, because we would use that same sky dome image as the background that was visible beyond the mountain ranges in the deep background so that the lighting and the the background sky sort of matched. We used that um, that same lighting rig, which was affectionately dumb, dubbed the Thunderdome. We used it for uh, a lot of the dog sledding parts of the movie, which was uh, done on the soundstage with the sled and the actors riding on the sled on a motion base and a motion control camera. Um, And then we would light them with this overhead LED light rig. Uh, The beauty of the light rig in that regard was we could 
do changeovers of lighting conditions virtually instantly. So it really allowed us to move quickly through that material. I think we did something like 90 different setups over the course of two days, which is really moving fast considering there were dozens of different lighting conditions. If you enjoyed this Masterclass podcast, please sign up to our newsletter at thefocus.com slash subscribe to keep up with future podcasts as well as get the latest visual effects content, tailored job alerts, and virtual learning materials straight to your inbox. You can also subscribe, follow, or like us on our social media channels at The Focus Careers. We'll share the links to those channels in the description. We'll speak again next time.